Thank you, Grayson, worship team. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, just such a reminder. So appreciate uh, the emphasis this morning. So appreciate the song. Uh, so appreciate the uh, idea that in honesty, you know, we as, as believers, sometimes we are the disciples in the boat when everything is in chaos. And uh, we think that Jesus uh, is asleep on the job, right? That somehow he's not controlling things and we want him to wake up, right? To pay attention to the suffering in our relationship, uh, the struggles in our own soul of trying to figure out who we are and what matters and uh, struggles with identity. Uh, just to <clears throat> feel like we're uh, not under the pall of a, of a world where it seems like so many people have lost their minds and things are happening. Uh, and we want Jesus, and, and that's an echo uh, in you here in that little psalm. It's a, in that song is a little echo of what you find in the psalms as uh, David often says, Lord, please rise up. Rise up, right, on my behalf. And so I hope that uh, one of the things that uh, you pick up from before I head into the book of Ephesians uh, is that as you face the difficulties of the day, we're tempted to go all kinds of places to try to resolve the tension that the chaos causes, right? Uh, you can't live under the pressure of just constant chaos and, and worry and fright. You can't live under that without trying to find some relief and People will try to find it in drugs. People try to find it in alcohol. People try to find it in pornography. People try to find it in, in, in you know, uh, angry political commentary. They'll try to find it in um, um, distractions of all sorts. And I just want to encourage you, as, as uh, uh, it's said so well here, is, Lord, that we, we need to go to you in moments of difficulty to get righted, to figure out what really matters. Right? Chaos can make you do some really stupid things. Right? It can make you do some really stupid things. Stupid things to other people that you love. It's amazing, right? If you, I'm sure none of you have ever done that, where you're having a really bad day, and so you make everybody in your life have a crappy day. Right? Uh, and really, they're not, they're not responsible for anything. It's just that things are going bad for you, and so daggone it. Uh, you can't take it out on your boss. You can't do anything about Afghanistan. You can't grab somebody who's talking about COVID and strangle them, right? Uh, you can't do any of those things, but daggone it, you can chew up your, your husband's ear, right? Or give the person at the restaurant, uh, you, know, you know, an earful, right? Or do those kinds of things. Or get on Facebook and spout off and do something, right? Uh, those are the moments as the people of God when we desperately need God to say, remind us that he's here, that he's present, that he's more than sufficient for these, and that we're undergirded by his loving arms and his sovereign care, right, in those moments. Now, I want to encourage you to turn to the book of Ephesians. Uh, I'm going to begin with an apology. My voice, I'm into the season of cheering for games right now. Uh, some of you have been around here before. Uh, so I was over uh, watching a, just a, a stirring, exciting flag football game yesterday with first and second graders, uh, high skill, speed, all the things that you're thinking about in terms of that uh, as we were watching them. And I was watching the, the excellent coaching of uh, Coach Cato and Coach Rogers, right? Uh, uh, you know, uh, Grayson, who was up here, and Kyle Rogers, Coach Colton, uh, and uh, who's Kyle's son, and Tobias, my grandson, and of course the best boy on the field, uh, was out there right during that period of time. And we were watching the coaches were doing an admirable job. We actually won, which is all that matters, of course, uh, at the end of the game, uh, and all those things happened. But Rick and I both concluded that as good a job as Kyle and, and Grayson were doing, that we were going to get little earpieces and put in the, the ears of our grandson so that they could know what they should do, really, out on the field. So as I was yelling out on the field yesterday, uh, <clears throat> my wife turns to me and said, Greg, you better shut up because you won't have any voice yesterday. And she said it with real love, right, and concern, uh, right for me, but I was uh, trying to give everybody their due support and, of course, direct people when they were missing what they should have seen, right? Okay, so uh, if you have your, your, your uh, copy of the scriptures, I want you to turn to the book of Ephesians. And I really want to encourage you. I know that if you have an electronic copy, that's okay. Some of you like to look at other uh, versions and different things while we're going through. But I would really encourage you, number one, to have two things. Have your booklet when you come, right? And if some of you are sitting here and saying, I don't know what you're talking about with a booklet. We have booklets uh, that we have brought. I'm glad I see somebody who's new who's got one. Let's see, Tracy's got one over here, right? 
so these are the badges. I hope that you'll pick one of those up when you come. If you don't have one, uh, I'm going to kind of review what we do in those booklets today. But it really, I, I want you to get one. Uh, we're doing two things through this series, and it's something that we haven't done as straightforwardly before. We, we obviously want to teach through the book of Ephesians. We want God's word uh, to be taught. That's the, uh, we exist to honor God, to understand him, to give him his due. And that's one of the things we're going to focus on today. And to love people and to grow in relationship with Jesus Christ. So we want to teach the word, but at the same time, we're trying to teach people how to understand their own scriptures, right? Now, hopefully every time we teach the word of God, we're faithful in a way that you can figure out where we get to. But here we're trying to be more explicit about the kind of process that's behind uh, studying this book, and, and we're going to provide extended opportunities for you to share what you're learning, right, as we work through the book of Ephesians. So this is a little bit of a different sort of series, and so what you're going to see me do today is a little bit different than what you might normally see me do here with the book of Ephesians, because I want you to see what I've been looking at and the way I've approached it, and we've kind of laid out a little bit of a rubric on how to study uh, and it's basically a, a basic sort of process if you're trying to listen well to somebody else, right? They have a thing if you're in a relationship with another person, they often call it, especially in counseling, active listening. And active listening is where you actually shut your mouth while the other person is talking, right? Uh, and you constrain your mind from wandering everywhere else, right? What we often do, especially if we're in an argument with somebody else, we're, if we're polite enough, we're not too heated, we, we at least shut our mouth long enough for them to say what they're saying, but while they're speaking, I'm already formulating my response to what they're going to say, and I really don't hear them at all. And so I'm just waiting, I'm being polite enough for waiting for them to stop, and they would say, are you done? And then I let them have it, right? Uh, and they're saying, I don't think you heard anything I just said. Well, I don't care about what you just said, I want to tell you what I said, right? But here with Scripture, in the same way, we need to pause, so we, we first come to the passage and we sit there and observe it. We want to say, what is it actually talking about? What is its subject? And I say this for some of us who've been around the, 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 the Christian world for a while. Some of the passages that we go back to are very familiar to us. And one of the dangers about the familiarity is that we don't read it again. We just read over it again. And so I want to pause and observe it and say, well, who's being talked about? What's the major issue? What's the subject matter, right, that's under discussion? Who is being talked about? What did that person do? What did they not do? Am I being told about something or am I being commanded to do something? I'm, I'm looking at all those little things I want to observe. And then, as a good listener, I want to pause and summarize what I just read, right? So Colin and Savannah are moving toward marriage, right? They're, they're engaged, so I just picked them out. Savannah all of a sudden realized I'm talking about her. But uh, they're moving toward marriage, and as they're doing that, right, uh, one of the things in, in learning well is as she listens to Colin, before she responds, she wants to say, okay, Colin, this is what I heard you just say. And then Colin goes, no, you completely missed it, right? And then we work at it one more time and say, okay, well, then clarify it. Well, then what did, what did I miss and what I just heard you say? And then we clarify it back and forth. And then finally, when, Savannah, when, when Colin says, that's what I'm saying, that's what I'm saying. So, okay, now Savannah's ready to respond to it. Now she's ready, okay? So in the same way with Scripture, after we've listened to it carefully, we summarize it and we say, this is what Paul's talking about. And once we've done that, now we're ready to start thinking because what Scripture is about. Well, then what does that mean for me? How does that change the way I think about myself, about God, about the world? Does it adjust some of my behavior? Does it affect the way I'm worrying today? Does it affect the way I'm spending my money, right? And then as far as Christians are concerned, always God's working in you so he can work through you, right? So you're never just a little, you know, cul-de-sac, right, of the grace of God, right? that it just comes and resides on you, and then it stops right there, and there's no through street. No, no, you're not a cul-de-sac. God, when he's teaching you something, when he's changing you, he's going to provide an opportunity for you to share it with somebody else, right? And so we're going to have an outlet. So what you're going to find in this booklet is it starts off with we get a passage that we're going to preach on in the coming week, and as you begin on Monday, you're going to observe it, and then you're going to summarize it, then you're going to say, well, what does this mean for me? And then you're going to look for an opportunity to share what you've learned with somebody else. Okay? So that's the rhythm of what we're going to be going through over and over again. That's what you'll see me do this morning as we come to the passage. 
Now I'm going to begin just by reading the passage to you. Uh, and uh, as we do that, could you stand with me and let me read it with you uh, as we begin? Now, I- I'll always, for the sake of it, just so that you know, it's always a little bit of a complication uh, these days in the West, is I will read from the New International Version, is what I read from. Uh, it's my preferred translation. Uh, it's the one I read from. Other people read from the English Standard Version. Some people read from uh, the uh, Christian Standard Bible. Those are the main translations that people often use. Some people use the New King James Version, and there's some who use the King James Version, right? And versions differ uh, for a, a couple of basic reasons because of either, one, the philosophy that guides the translation, what they're trying to do in the translation, or to the audience they're trying to shoot at, okay? Now, there's another translation we often use called the New Living Translation that many of you may be reading, right? So those are different. So you'll find the wording's different in terms of that, but the wording's, it's the text underneath is not different, but the wording's different based on what the goal of the translation is. So New Living Translation, if you're here as a family, it's a really good translation for reading to children because it's geared to children. It's, it's geared for like a fourth or fifth grade reading level, right? And most of us adults said, I love to be spoken of in a way I can understand, right? But the, the, it's, it's geared for that. And if, if that is one you want to use, use it. Daggone it, use it, right? Don't, don't fiddle around and flirt with a whole bunch of them. And we're memorizing from the NIV. We're encouraging you to do that. But if you always use the New Living Translation and that is your Bible and you study that all the time, well, then you, you memorize it in the New Living Translation. Don't float around all over the place, right? If you're an ESV person, which, of course, you're the, you've got the best translation ever, according to the ESV people, right, then, then memorize it, right? Whatever it is that you want to do in terms of that, be consistent. Don't float around, right? Get purposeful and make a plan. Right? But I'm going to preach here from that. I think most of them will do as well. But, but memorize it. The biggest thing is not so that you can say a bunch of words in sequence. is that you can say them with meaning and understanding. You got me? Right? With meaning and understanding. That's what you want. All right, let's, pr- let's read. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and his will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, the one he loves, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and earth under Christ. In him, Christ, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of the truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is the deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. God add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Okay, now let's take a little look here. And uh, one of the things we always encourage you to do, but we, we, we kind of jumped in this time, is that one of the things that we're always doing if we're reading Scripture appropriately, we're going, to, we're going to treat all the parts, but we're going to make sure that all the parts fit into the whole, right? Because a book is, if it's a consistent piece of writing, it's not like a bag of marbles, right, where somebody has this bag of, of Ephesians and they say, well, I'm going to throw this marble in it and throw that one in it and throw that one in it. No, it's, a, it's an argument. It's a presentation of a thought. And so one of the things I want to do, I've always got a dialogue between the big picture and the small picture, 
Okay? Now, I was trying to think of an example of this, right? When uh, I've known my wife now for 39 years. We, ex we celebrated our 38th anniversary, but of course we dated for a year ahead of that time, right? So I've known her for 39 years. And when my wife says things to me now, the big picture of her and her personality affects the way I hear what I hear, right? When I'm in my right mind, okay? Now, what I mean by that Rana can say some things if you're from the outside that sound harsh, right, if you're someone from the outside. And somebody will walk into our home. I remember we had a, a girl stay in our home for a long time. And she was there because she was being treated uh, for cancer for a while. And she lived with us for about seven months. And she lived in a home where nobody spoke their mind, right? And so it was one of those, I grew up a little bit in that kind of home where there was a problem in the middle of the room and everybody walked around it, hinting at the problem, hoping somebody would deal with the elephant, right? Can somebody do something with the elephant, right? Uh, but nobody wanted to talk about it publicly. And so it was sitting there, but it just wasn't handled outwardly. And I had a family that was like that. Well, Rana didn't grow up in a family like that. If there's an elephant in the room, somebody daggone is describing the elephant, right? They're holding up the trunk, pulling out the ears, right? It's tail, daggone, that elephant is standing right here. And there's an elephant, and I'm going to talk about the elephant, right? Now, if you're, if you're on the other hand, and you're not used to that kind of thing, when Rana came at me, before I had any context to know that she loved me, and I trusted her, and I got upset by that. And I said, that's just not the way you deal with things like that. But now, because I know she loves me, and I know the woman that she is, and that's the personality that she's is, I don't take that personally as if she's attacking me. I say that she's doing what she does to love me. Right? And, and thankfully, I have a woman that can tell me I'm an idiot at times when I'm an idiot. That's only rare, very seldom, right? No, but sometimes she can step in, and in the right way, and I know she does it because she loves me, that she wants to say, that, Greg, we got to talk about this. We can't leave this lay around. Now, it's not that we do that all the time, but the context of our relationship helps me to interpret that event. Right? And sometimes if I don't have it, it's hard to do that. And here, the context of this book is important to read this passage in. So the first thing when you read a book, you read it all the way through. You read it repeatedly because the whole book, you want to read it, okay? Now, there's other things we can talk about here. But as I read it, one of the things I want to see is that Paul's going to reveal the theme, the major thought in the passage we're in. So God's plan, this is the major thought, God's plan is to bring all things to their appointed end for the praise of his glory in Christ, or Christ is, the, is through his work and person, and by the power of the Spirit. So that's the main idea of the whole book, the thing that he's going to elaborate on, and then he's going to draw out the practical implications of. And so Paul wants to relate the universe-encompassing scale of the salvation plan of God to the experience of believers as individuals and in community with each other, right? He wants the truth about who God is and what he's up to to shape their lives, right? And so if we look at the overarching structure then, this is kind of how it breaks down. And this is where it gets the title, right? So for the first three chapters, he wants them to enjoy God's triumph. And there's language all the way through this book about God in Christ doing battle against forces that are arrayed against us. And matter of fact, doing battle on our behalf so that we can be awakened from our, our, our dead slumber. And this God triumphs in Christ and sits us up above all of these hostile forces that are against us so that we don't need to worry about them. And then Christ in his triumph in chapter 4, he gives gifts to people, us, the church. So he gives us gifts in order to live out this new life that we've had. And then he primes us for the battle. So when we get to chapter 6... We're going out to battle every day with, with, with dark forces in us and around us. And now we've got, we can be clothed with Jesus so that we need not fear, we need not cower, we can be on mission, but also we're not naive and we're not jumping out there as if we can make it on our own. Right? So this triumph. And then so the first part is what, what has God done and is he doing and will do in Christ to restore and reclaim everything? And then verse chapters 4 to 6 is the practical implications of that. Right, if that's who God is, well then, how should I address COVID? How should I be dealing with the threats to my physical health? How should I be thinking about my physical life? Is it really true for Christians that safety is their first concern? And the answer biblically is no. The major concern is faithfulness. 
But why does that make sense? What if my faithfulness actually causes me to be sick and die? Yeah, right? To live in Christ is to die again because I'm secure in God, right? I don't fear what other people fear. I shouldn't, right? What if, what if following Jesus makes everybody hate me, okay? Well, again, that's not my goal. I hope that's not your goal, right? It's not our goal to be people that aren't liked. But the question is, right, the end goal is to be faithful to God. And the best neighbor I can be is a neighbor full of Jesus. And if they don't like that, I'm grieved over that. I'm lamenting over that. I'm praying over that. I'm praying for them with a broken heart, not with a haughty spirit. I'm broken over that, and I'm praying for them. But I'm not going to change my behavior because they don't like it, because it's not their approval that matters. The best way I can love my neighbor is at the end of the day have God say to me, good job, Greg. But, 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 but God, so-and-so doesn't like me. Well, Greg, you obeyed me, you loved me, you followed me, you turned them toward me, you leave them to me. Okay? So at the end of the day, this is the big picture that I want to keep in mind. So we're in a descriptive passage. We're going to talk about this as describing what God's doing and what you're going to find. There are no commands in chapters 1 through 3. It doesn't tell us to do anything. We're just learning. But then when you get to chapters 4 through 6, all of a sudden, do this, don't do that. Do this, don't do that. Right? And so that's where we're going to come. Now, so now that first section in 1 through 3, and this is in your, this is in your little uh, handbooks, this is how it breaks out as I read it, and we're just going to be in A, praising God for his loving provision that comes to his people according to his sovereign plan in Christ by the Spirit. Now, I'm jumping ahead a little bit with that because that's how I summarize the passage that I'm in, okay? And I want to talk a little bit about how I got there to do that. So theme, the big picture, and now we're coming down. Now, let's do some observing, right? Now, here, I want to say, as you read this week, and some of you are, be as I'm asking this question, you're going, oh, I really didn't read too much this week. That's all right. Feel guilty. You should feel guilty, right? No, but the issue is, uh, I'm not trying to make you feel guilty. I want to encourage you, right? I, this is, this is uh, I, I want to be, I, I have tasted by God's grace the goodness of Jesus. I have tasted, I want you to taste it. I want you to taste it, right? I want you to taste it. I'm, I, I'm not, I don't want you to be motivated by guilt. I don't want you to be motivated because I'm going to check on your notebook, right? All those kind of things like that. Right? I know what it's like to live that way. Right? I, I want to beckon you because Jesus is worth it. Right? And the thing that we know, and we've heard this as a cliche so many times, the people that you love, you attend to them. Well, how are you going to attend to Jesus? You're going to attend to the word that he's given us through his authorized representatives, the Apostle Paul. And so as a church together... We want to, and this is kind of cool about the book of Ephesians when we get to chapter 3, not only are we coming into a deeper understanding by God's grace of what it means to be loved by Jesus, but that deeper understanding that we get individually equips us to come together and more fully explore it as a group of people, to see it in its multifaceted beauty, right? Something that changed me in college way back when, and it was, it was in the psalm that we sang today, uh, I never thought about this. This wasn't part of my Christian vocabulary, and I didn't think about it in those categories. But I remember uh, Steve Green was the, was the, Keith Green, not Steve Green. Keith Green was the big uh, uh, guy who was coming on the scene in college circles. I mean, this was before we had the uh, abundance of different songs and things we have now. But Keith Green was like this uh, hippie guy from California. And we know, if you know Will, nothing good comes out of California. We know that, <laughs> right? And so we're, we're talking about California. And, and so Keith Green comes out. I was disposed in the tradition I grew up to that he was edgy. He was like a hippie guy. He was in a whole bunch of different things going on, Jesus movement stuff. So I was already had my guard up, I had my, my you know, defenses up. And I had this kid that was in my dorm when I was a resident assistant. And he kept saying to me, you know, Greg, Greg, you should listen to him. Nah, I don't want to listen to that. You know, kind of stuff like that. Well, I'd never even listened to it before. So I picked it up and I started listening to it right surreptitiously, right, privately, so that nobody knew that I was listening to it, right? And this is back in that, you know, the, the technology of that time was a cassette tape, right? So I, I'd, I'd get find somewhere, put a cassette tape in, right, and put on my little Sony Walkman and put it around my head, 
okay? Nobody knew what I was listening to. They, they probably thought I was uh, listening to George Beverly Shea, right, from the Billy Graham crusade, right? But whatever, I'm listening to that, and as I'm listening to that, one thing that gets me, it starts to grab my heart. And he's saying scripture. He's saying scripture. I didn't have a pro- I couldn't, I couldn't figure out any way to criticize scripture. <laughs> now, he's saying it in different ways, But, you know, one of the things that got me is that there was this reality of his relationship with Christ that I yearned for. And one of the songs I still, Oh Lord, came from Psalm 127 and so many other passages. Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. Right? Please turn your eyes on your child. And I said, "I, I want that. I want that kind of reality to my walk with Jesus. And it spurred me on. And I found his music to be so convicting, so challenging, so passionate, right? And it wasn't perfect. He wasn't a perfect man. No, no, none of are. But I just want to beckon you into the riches. And this is a passage about riches, right? It's a passage about riches. So I wanted you to get you to come after. All right, so here's the big picture. Now, if you read... Did you observe and what did you see? And here's some things that I just want to look at, some of my observations, when I'm trying to say what is the passage really about? And here it's really a who passage. Who is the passage really about? It's not a a what passage. It's not telling you about things. And if you thought it was about things, let me just humbly say you missed it. Okay? And, And a part of Bible study is not everything you come up with is going to be right. Okay? Let me just say that. Okay, the Holy Spirit is not confusing, right? And this is where the community comes in, where we, we read the scriptures at times, and it's okay to share things that you come up with, but also it's okay to say, well, that's an interesting thought, but help me understand how you got there from the passage. Because that's where we want to get there, right? We're not criticizing people or lording over each, but one of the things we don't want to do, because we know the evil one, one of the things that he loves to do is distort scripture, right? Seriously. Right? The characteristic of a charlatan is somebody who knows enough Bible and has a silver tongue, and they can convince Christians that they're speaking with God's authority. In reality, they're using God's name to undermine his authority. Right? So our experience is always checked against the Bible. And so if you come up with something that is outside the text, right, or something that you come up with an insight, well, we want to come back and say, help us get there from here. Right? Now, here's one of the things. Here's some observations, and I'm going to give you one. Right? Now, here's something that I do sometimes with highlight markers, but I want you to say gold is for God the Father, red is for Jesus, and you can't quite see it, but green, which doesn't come out real well, is for the Spirit. Okay? Now, one of the things you find about this, there's a lot of references to God. Right? And to God the Father, look at all those yellow places. God the Father of, who blessed us, he chose, his sight, he predestined, um, his pleasure and will, praise of his glorious grace, he has freely given, he loves, God's grace, he, his will according, his good pleasure, he purposed in Christ, right, the plan of him, the purpose of his will, praise to his glory, right, God's possession, praise of his glory, right? Now, if you thought this was about you, you missed the point, It's not about you. And then secondly, look at all the references to Jesus, right? And Lord Jesus Christ, in Christ, in him, through Jesus Christ, right? In the one, in him, his blood, right? In Christ, under Christ, in him, right? In Christ, in Christ, in him, right? Did you get that? A lot of in things going on right here. Now, it seems like, but wait a minute, we believe in a triune God, right? One God, three persons, all equally God, distinct in their personhood. Right? And you think, well, wait a minute, the Holy Spirit gets kind of short shrift here, right? He only gets mentioned explicitly once, the promised Holy Spirit. Right? What about that? But if you notice back up at the very beginning, our 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 key verse, spiritual blessings, well then for Paul, every good thing that you get by God's plan that was made possible through the work of Christ on the cross and his resurrection and ascension. All of those benefits are made effective to you by whom? The Holy Spirit. So actually all of the good things that he lavishes on us are the work of the Holy Spirit based on the work of Jesus Christ because God planned it to be that way. 
So really, I didn't do it because it would be so confusing. The rest of the passage would almost be green. Do you follow me on that? So, so much of that is about, so that's one of my observations, that God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're certainly pretty important, right, to what's going on, right? And, all, and of course, he's offering praise to God, not praise to me or to you or to any other human being, right? So he's directing our attention. Here's another one, right? Now, this is kind of interesting. There's a whole bunch of action words, verbs, right, in here. And I don't know if you noticed about who's doing all the actions, it's not only is God mentioned a lot, Jesus mentioned a lot, the Holy Spirit is acting, but all the actions are done by God. We don't do hardly anything, right? And, and so one of the things we're going to simply, it's very clear from the very beginning from Ephesians, and we're going to find out why, is that you don't want to, if you don't know Jesus, you don't want to know Jesus, you won't pursue Jesus, God will pursue you. God is the one who's going after. You can't save yourself. You won't want to save yourself. Because by nature, you're going to move the other direction. Or you'll even try to make God something that, that affirms your life. You'll just add him to your life, right? You'll adopt a silly posture that's not biblical. That's one of those things. It's one of those little statements you hear around all the time. Christian faith which is just terribly false. God helps those who help themselves. No. No. God helps those who can't help themselves. That's what he does. He rescues rebels. He rescues people who are people destined for wrath because they don't care about God and they've rebelled against him, right? Nice people, mean people, rich people, poor people, right? And God, he acts to do something that they don't deserve, right? This is why we're going to find. But notice here, he's blessed, he chose, he predestined, he's freely given, the one he loves in him we have redemption. He lavished, right? He prepared. He made known. He purposed to bring to unity, right? Chosen, predestined, works out. We're included, marked, right? Now, what do human beings do, okay? Notice right at the top, you can't see it very well, but the word praise. <laughs> they praise. One of the lessons from this passage is, well, how should we respond to this passage? Well, one thing we should do is praise God, right? Right? They praise, but what happens here, if you see down here at the bottom, they put their hope in him. They hear of him, and they believe. And it's going to be very clear that belief is not something where, you know, God, I, you know, I earn something from God. It's where I hear about God, I hear about myself, I hear about the desperate situation I'm in, and I go, God, God, help me. Do something for me I can't do for myself. God, I put my trust in you because I don't trust me or anything else. God, do for me what I can't do. God, help you're my only hope, right? So when you look about this, something that as you observe, it's about God, right? And here I just want to challenge you is that Paul thinks for the Ephesian believers that before he begins talking about their problems, they need to look up first, right? We want to begin with our problems and forget about the God. And so what happens? Our problems get really big and God gets really small. But if you go to the scriptures and your God is really big, then you approach your problems very different. Right? So one of those things. Now, another one I observed here. Okay? In terms of uh, what's going on here. All of the uh, uh, kind of blessings that we get here. What are the spiritual blessings? Okay? Okay. Um, so what two things about God we find here, that God is all-powerful and God is good. So one, we find that God's the one's doing everything. God's the subject under discussion. But this one just emphasizes that, that God is exercising his power, a sovereign power, to bless people. Right? If you're in the ancient world, like you in many places around the world, right, behind Afghanistan, behind the Taliban, is a way of viewing God, that God is this ruthless God, that you need to appease him. He calls for blood, right? Now, this is not every uh, Muslim, but in the Taliban, this is where it is. The God who's ruthless. To talk about a loving God is inconsistent with Allah. That's not what you talk about with him. God, he's, he's a God of justice, a God of power, right? And, and you need to do everything that you possibly can so that you can wind up on the right side of him when you die. Right? 
that kind of God is not this God. That's not the God of the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? In the ancient world, they thought that the, the world is inhabited with all these kinds of gods, like if you were in India today as a Hindu, right? Or in, you're in Africa or South America or, or Haiti, right? There's a, there's a whole bunch of malevolent things out there, evil things out there. And I need to get some mechanisms so that I can control things and keep them at bay. And they got their own purposes and they're screwing up my life. And so I got I to I do some sacrifices to keep them at bay. I got to ingratiate myself to them. I got to do that. Kind of, but no God is for me. To have that idea that God is for you, that, that's ridiculous. Gods are gods and they got their own stuff. You can sometimes coerce them, manipulate them, stay out of your, their way, but they're not for you. Right? Today, if you're in a time of suffering, do you really believe that God is for you? That even in his sovereignty and his providence, whatever you're wrestling with today, God in his mercy still has his good purposes at, at stake. He hasn't left you. He's given himself to you forever, right? So he blessed us. He chose us, right? Just in the idea all of us have experienced, right, when, you, when we were little, not being chosen. Right? And many of us, by virtue of the way we look, by the virtue of the background that we have, by virtue of the, the lack of gray matter that we may or may not have, right? Whatever the case may be, our society says, no, don't choose you. No, don't choose you. No, don't choose you. You're never getting viral. No, you're not important. But God looked down at everyone and he said, I choose you. And the big thing is who's doing the choosing, right? I choose you in love. Adoption, right? Not just to choose you to say, okay, you guys are irritating. I choose you on my team, but get, get over there on the bench and shut up, right? You guys are so stinking annoying. I'm going to pick you up out of the miry clay, but just sit over there because you stink, right? No, no, no. So, no, you come into my house. You're my kids. You're my kids. You come in. I love you, right? And freely given to us, riches of God's grace. God's not stingy. Do you ever feel God's stingy? God, you didn't, you know, on the talent, the talent list, I came, I, I must have been in the caboose, right? Did you even give me the talent thing? I mean, the looks thing. God, why? Why did you do this? Why did I get my dad's chest and my mom's legs? That's me, right? Why did I get that? God, couldn't you rearrange the parts a little bit better, right? And why did I get my mom's height? Why didn't I get my dad's height? I waited and waited to get to six foot, never made it, right? <laughs> you know, and now I'm going the other direction, right? So why, right? Why didn't you give me a kind of personality that could be the center of the attention in the room? Why can't I feel comfortable like that? Why do I just find it hard just to talk to people? I feel like I have things to say, but nobody wants to give me time to say them because I can't get them out, Right? You know, those kind of, do you really believe that God, God has lavished things on you? Like you're, so I've said this to you many times. After you read this passage, the problem with us as Christians, we don't need anything else from God. We just need a deeper appreciation of what we already have. Right? I mean, you're sitting there and, and you're, you're, you're the, uh, you know, the elf king, right? All these Lord of the Rings people. And you're sitting in there and you got, you got so much gold, you're drowning in it. And you're over there gone like he is with greed. I can't, I, I got one other, one other gem I, I got to have or my life isn't full. And this passage is going, you know, Greg, you're sitting on a, a, a mountain of riches. What is wrong with you? That's the way we are as believers. Right? So these are just some of my observations. Now here's another one. Right? So then I went to look about, well, does Paul have direction? Does he, is he moving down through the passage? And here's some things that I found. Notice it begins with praise, the head, and then he explains the praise in verse 4 with 4. So it's a change. So you'll see this in my outline. And then he summarizes the goal of all that work is to bring unity to all things. And then when he turns to verses 11 through 14, he starts talking to two different groups, the we and the you. Who's the we and the you? We, 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 and then you, 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 right? Not we, we, we as in the little pigs, but we, right? So we, and then also, also, but now we, who is the we, Paul, and the people with him, and then the Ephesians, or is the we and you, somebody else, okay, in terms of that? So I noticed that. So here's how I broke the passage down, and this is where you can fill in your blanks if you're looking to. 
praising God for his loving provision that comes to his people according to his sovereign plan in Christ by the Spirit. That's my summary. That's what I think the passage is about. And then he does three things. In verse 3, he declares praise to the Father for his lavish spiritual generosity in Christ by the Spirit. Now we're going to find out what do you mean, Paul, in Christ. That's a kind of a cryptic phrase. Well, one of the things, I'm going to let the book explain it. I'm not going to spend all the time going through it because he's going to spend the whole book telling us, well, what did Christ do so that we could have God's plan, his loving plan, be effective in our life? And then what does the Spirit do? Right? But we know here from this passage that all of God's plan is made of, comes to us through Jesus and is made effective by the work of the Spirit. We know that. Okay? We know that here. Well, then in, in verses three, uh, uh, 4 through 10, he describes the sovereign plan in Christ by the Spirit to unite all things under Christ. What does that mean? Bring all things up together under Christ. Well, we're going to see that as he develops it all the way through and I'll just give you a little peek ahead, right, is he's going to write everything with respect to itself, write everything with respect to him, and unite everything in worship under him as God has created it all along to do so that it might come to the fullness of everything God created. Now, I'm going to come back and say that over and over again, but take us to the goal to the, against false teachers today who are saying you have your best life now, God wants to say he's working in your life right now to give you the best life forever. Because this life is going to be a life of battle and struggle. Okay? But one day, we'll get to enter into the fullness of that triumph and everything that God intended will happen to us. Right? The king will come. He'll make peace everywhere. He'll give us peace in our hearts Man, as I sing those songs today, I got turmoil in my heart because of my own struggle with sin. I got turmoil in my heart because of people that I care about, that I'm brokenhearted over, that I'm praying for, that I feel they're in danger. I've got turmoil in my heart because of the craziness in the culture and trying to respond to other Christians, some of them over here who are convinced that it's God's will that you get vaccinated 30 times, and some of them over here are convinced that it's God's will that you never have a needle within 300 yards of you. And they're so convinced about that that they get, they're putting themselves off on each side. And you got a whole bunch of people in between who are trying to figure out, I just want to know what's wise to do. That's all I want to do, right? And you've got these kinds of polarizations, and it causes tension. And what happens to us often as Christians, then we talk about less and less because there's minefields everywhere to talk about. So I know something safe. I'm going to come in and talk about Chris and say, Chris, it's hot today. And Chris is going to go, yeah, it is hot today, Greg. Amen, Chris. I love you as a brother. And then off we go. Because I don't want to get into anything else. I got all this turmoil in my soul. And if I pick it up and I find out Chris is crazy on this issue, I don't know if I want to deal with it. I'm already dealing with all the crazy stuff in my soul. I got turmoil around me, right? My wife is, is solid, but the rest of us are all screwed up, right? I got turmoil around me in the lives of people. People are making bad decisions. Some people are making wise decisions. Some people are wanting me to help them make decisions. Right? I got turmoil around me. I got things about my own identity that I'm struggling with, right? We sang that song, The Transitions of Life. You know what I'm thinking about? I'm in the empty nest transition. Ron and I have wrestled in it. Some of you are on the transition to marriage. Some of you are on the transition of leaving your home to be on your own as an adult, and you're, you don't want to adult, right, as if that was a verb, right? You don't want to adult, Right? You just want to, you want to go back right? and, and build a rocket ship and stay in the house and ride your tricycles. Right? All, all that kind of, I mean, because the world is like nutty. Right? You've got a kid that you're worried about. You've got an adult son that's moved away from the Lord. You've got these kinds of things, and you want to retreat from life. Right? The turmoil in our souls. Right? Well, what, God, what are you up to? What are you doing? God, one day you're going to bring shalom, peace. I don't have to deal with that. Okay, all, the, all those things, right? His sovereign pain. And then this is where, and we'll develop this in the way out. When Paul says we, he's referring to Jews. When he says you, he's referring to Gentiles. Because he says we who first hoped in Christ, and then you who now have had the Spirit. So one of the things we're going to find out is that this is a plan that involves bringing Jews and Gentiles, meaning when God unites all things, he not only writes us on the vertical plane, he writes us on the horizontal plane. 
And we're going to find all about it in chapter 2. Christ brings peace between us and God, and he brings peace between us and each other. Because he's going to write everything. Right? He's going to write everything. Now, so, here's how I just made this for myself. Now, I'm not, you, you can take a picture of it. I don't mean for you to take notes on it. But what I put here, I've got God the Father's plan. It's accomplished in Christ the beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit makes it happen. Well, what's all the things that happen? I'm chosen for a relationship that's going to restore and reclaim me as a human being. It's a relationship of love. Christ didn't, didn't bring me to himself just to get me out of the way or make me a minion, right? A bunch of little yellow minions running around in the church. I no, he wanted to bring me to life. So he chose me that, and his good pleasure, his loving favor. What motivated God to do it? Well, there's no power outside of him. He wasn't forced to, you know, Greg, you know, like somebody, you know, uh, remember when you were growing up in your home, right, and your, your, your parents were trying to encourage you to act Christ-like even though you didn't want to? And so you walk into a group of other kids that are sitting in there, and there's little uh, lonely Jason sitting over on the side, right, little lonely Jason sitting over the side, and they come to you and they say, okay, Colin, when you go in there, you see, look, Jason, why don't you go sit next to him? And Colin's going, I don't want to sit next to him. He's a loser, right? We know Jason's a loser. And so he doesn't want to go sit next to him, right, in terms of those kinds of things. And so the idea of what motivated Colin to go sit with Jason is that somebody was telling him that he should do it and he felt guilty and he couldn't figure out any way to get out of it. Well, wh- why, did God, why did God choose us? There's no power outside of him that said, God, you've got to do something with those cruddy, cruddy beings down there. Oh, come on. I, I don't want to have anything to do with them, right? Look at them. They've screwed up so many times. Oh, no, God, you've got to do it. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, you, you, you. All right, I've got a couple of them. Okay, thanks. No, out of his good, his desire, he wanted to bring rebels to life. He wanted to save people who hated him. He wanted to take people who had screwed up their lives completely and change them. He wanted to bring them to life. Why? Because it pleased him to do it. Right? Pleased him to do it. So what, what's he do? He redeems us, a costly freedom. We're going to talk about that. He pays through the blood of Christ what was necessary for us to come out from underneath God's wrath. He, he gave us insight and wisdom, a knowledge about, right, one of the things of friendship, and Jesus talks about this, how do you know that, that God loves us? He brings us in on his plans. He tells us who we are when the world's so confused. He tells us what's meaningful and good, and he tells us what we're supposed to be, and then he tells us what he's going to do for us. That's his love for us, and he gives us the skill and the ability to live that out. He adopts us. We're cherished children. He forgives us. He were reconciled to him. He takes out. We're at peace with him. He's not angry with us deservedly because of our sin. That's all been wiped out. So when he looks at that, he doesn't see the crap in my life. He says, that's my boy. That's my boy. I see Jesus. That's my boy. I love him. Sealed. He said, Greg, I'm going to put my spirit in you, give you a down payment to show you that I'm going to bring you to the goal for which I've saved you. So, Greg, nothing's going to take you from my loving care. So you don't need to fret about that. You may have a relationship with another human being that you feel like you could be abandoned at any moment, but I won't abandon you. I won't. Ever. Right? United, he's going to reconcile, bring peace between warring groups, right? We're in a a moment in history where it seems like we're all tribes fighting each other. There'll be one moment where we'll be around the throne of God, where all peoples and nations in Christ will be calling out praise to the God who made them, and there won't be any wars, there won't be any hatred, there won't be any climbing, there won't be any upmanship, right? And if you've never felt the tension of that, right, you kept your head in the sand, right, in the world around, you felt it in your home, you felt it in your friendships, right? That's just a slice, Right? Now, here's my applications, and I'll, I'll be done. Here's my applications, okay? I have four things, and, and take a picture of those if you, if you want to keep them. I won't have them up long enough probably for you to write them, obviously, but he, here's, here's some things that came to mind. There's so many things I could talk about. Everything in this passage revolves around God. He is at the center of everything. He works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will. 
is God at my center? Could you look at your week or my week this week and the only way you could explain about how you made it through or what guided you in the decisions you made is that you kept asking for wisdom from God, direction from God, help from God, and from God's people to help you keep God at the center. Right? Is that really true? Is he at the center of my relationship with that man or woman? Is he at the center of my pocketbook? Is he at the center of the way I think about myself as a person? Do I let his words tell me that I'm his child, that I have all kinds of riches, that I'm lavished upon by him? Do I believe that? That's what he says. And if I don't believe that, he's not at the center. I'm letting somebody else tell me who I am. Right? Second thing, no believer has less of the Father's blessings than any other. I have no more or less than anyone else. As a blessing from God, it prohibits pride. Right? So whatever God has given you, whatever gifts we're going to find, well, don't go around, you know, breaking your arm, trying to pat yourself on the back. And, and it's just, it's just, there should be no competition. Well, who, who dispenses his gifts? Well, God does. Well, how, what did he dispense to you and to me? Everything. Right? So as an equal blessing, it makes envy irrational and competition silly. Right? All are equally sons and daughters. Right? All, we're all sons and daughters. But there's so many other things out of this. I should value you as a son or daughter of God. I should expect that God's going to be speaking through you and, and touching my life because you've got all of his riches. Right? I should expect that he's going to be working uniquely through you in such a way that I need to learn from you. Right? There are some people in here who have not suffered, have suffered very little compared to other people. And we need to learn about following Jesus and suffering. Right? Now, fourthly, I have, according to God's estimation, everything I need to stand in his presence holy and blameless. Okay? This encourages obedience, right? So today, I've got all the resources I need to put up with Will, right? He's from California. I need a lot of resources, right, to put up with Will today, right? Will comes into my life. I just need tons of help from God. I just cry out, God, help, right? I sing the song, Jesus, wake up. No, I didn't sing that. But the idea is that I need help. Right? When, and you know, some of you have people, Will is not that in my life, but some of you have people, as soon as you see them, it, you're, you're going, God, help. Arise, Jesus. Right? Help. Right? Here comes my son or daughter. Help. Right? Here comes that my neighbor. Help. Here comes my employer. Help. Right? Well, I know today I'm not going out and I'm not unarmed. I got resources today. Right? But on the other hand, it makes disobedience something I'm responsible for because I can't turn back from God and say, you know, God, if you had that neighbor next to me, you'd behave the same way. No, no, Greg, I'm sorry. Or if you're at high school, okay, God, I know, I know what you call me to be with relationship to other people. But, you know, God, that's so uncool, and you know how it's going to make me stick out in that way? No, 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 no. Greg, I've given you everything you need today to follow me today. Yeah, but you don't understand my wife. You don't know how difficult she is. You don't know how hard it is. You don't know what she withholds with me. And God says, no, no, no. I've given you everything that you need to love her today. I'm not worried about what she's doing. I'm worried about whether or not you're appropriating what I gave you today. Because you're saying that I've not resourced you enough. Okay, God, yes, you have. Okay. Now, fourthly, I will take one of the blessings. Here's one of my action points. I'll take one of the blessings Paul lists in this passage and each day this week give thanks to God for it. I mean, certainly that's what Paul's encouraged to do. Just, you know, here's a good prayer time. Don't ask God for anything. Just come and reflect on the fact that he bought you at a costly price to make you his own. That I'm his. Pray. God, open my eyes to see it, right? And then I want to share it with somebody and I didn't have to plan too much for that because I get this opportunity. Right? But I did all along the week. I was sharing it with people all along the week. You know what? what something Ron and I have done, and, and uh, conclude here. Uh, we get up in the morning. We don't have time to sit down and study together. We don't. We want to study individually. But one thing that we did, right? And so uh, Kristen will like this one too, is one of the things that we do while we're both eating breakfast, because we, uh, we haven't figured out how to read with our mouths full yet. Uh, we've probably tried at other moments. But we'll go to a little app called BibleGateway.com. And we have it there, loaded now in our, in our uh, uh, BibleGateway.com. And we put it up on Ephesians 1, verses 3 to 14. And you can have it 
read, read to you, right? Some very nice, you know, gentleman in there. It sounds very uh, appropriate diction. We'll read it to you. And, and we, we'll, we'll read it because it only takes literally verses 3 through 14. It takes, I don't know, a minute, two minutes. Sometimes we'll just sit there and just play it three or four times and listen to it. Now, on our own, we'll study it, but there we want to listen to it, right? Now, Grace, I want you to come up here in a moment. And I know I've taken this, we'll sing, sing one song on our, on our way out here. But I, I, did, I did something a little bit different today than what we normally did to give you an idea. And I hope that this afternoon, I hope you'll come back, right? And we're going to have it online this afternoon too, right? So that if you can't come, if you know people, tune in, right, to listen. And what we're going to come together this afternoon is we've got a, we've got a panel where we're just going to talk a little bit about our own interaction with it, right, some of our own struggles to apply and understand it. We're also going to dig in and let you share with each other, what, what was God teaching you? Or, you know, as I look at this, I got this huge question, I couldn't get past it, you know, what, what, is it, what do you think about it? And we're just going to continue to engage it. And our goal is that as we come up more and more, that when, when the pastor comes up here to speak, most of that's going to say, yeah, I saw that, yeah, I saw that too, yeah, I saw that, and man, I saw this too, and I want to add that to it. And you know, we talked about this in our family. I talked about this with my wife. My kids brought this up to me this week. Right? I'll prepare all of us older people for expect God to use the mouth of babes to convict you. 